Hi. You know what I want to talk about? Digital networks are becoming denser and denser. We are online all the time, everywhere, and there are fewer and fewer places where we can really be alone. Where and when can we still disconnect? To be offline has become a luxury. Will we permanently ooze data through the cordless drip tubes of the smartphone? Or do we take back control over our connectivity? Eu não aguento mais vir no bar e tá todo mundo no celular! Ah, e dá mais atenção pra foto de comida? Backlight went on a journey to the edge of the internet with the White Spots app, developed especially for this occasion. It makes the invisible digital networks visible. The scanner shows the cell phone towers that communicate 24-7 with our smartphones and tablets. On the new White Spots world map, the areas with mobile phone and internet coverage are black. The White Spots are the areas where there's no signal yet. With the app, we go looking for the exit of the digital web that encloses us. This is Backlight. Welcome to the white spots of our world. Companies and governments want the whole wide world to be connected by wireless internet, so they are experimenting with drones and satellites to achieve total connectivity. <laughs> But what exactly will it mean if this master plan becomes a reality? Will we never be able to be alone again if the whole planet is connected and we can all be reached all the time, everywhere? Psychologist Sherry Turkle once described enthusiastically how computers are becoming part of our personal lives. Wow. But she now has serious objections. On our app, she sees the enormous density of cell phone towers around her. It just makes me sad. We're so connected and we're so trivially communicating. On the White Spots world map, she wants to create more sacred places without internet and mobile phone reception. I don't think there'll be places that will not be covered by the internet. Everything will be covered? Yeah. The entire planet? Yes. I think that uh, the sacred spaces are places that we create where we choose to not use connectivity. I mean, my classroom is technically black, except that nobody has a phone or a laptop in them. So it counts on your map as a black spot, but it's pure white. And in, among my colleagues, you know, we went from a position where we said, you know, it's great to have phones in classes and laptops in classes. You can be looking stuff up. You can be, you know, enhancing your experience by being on the web to realizing that actually it was taking our students away from the conversation of classes, away from conversations with us and with, their, with the people they were with. It was distracting them, they were shopping, they were on Facebook. And now we say, actually, laptops down, phones down, leave them in a basket. Uh, we, we, we're here together to be in a community. But you used to be quite a believer. Yes, I was, but I'm an empiricist. And it turns out that my observations of distraction were the same as what all the research was showing, which is that when an open laptop in a classroom creates a circle of distraction around that open laptop. So it's not just the person with the open laptop who is distracted. It's everyone around in a kind of concentric circles of distraction. And that research is so compelling. As a matter of fact, 89% of Americans say that in their last social interaction, they took out a phone. And 82% say that it deteriorated the conversation. 
So in America, we're at a kind of funny point where we're all the time doing something that we know is not really good for us. So I think we're at a point, a kind of tipping point, where there's the possibility for change. Welcome to the International Institute of Digital Detoxification. When you enter this area, we will take all of your digital technology, valuables, and anything else that doesn't quite fit in with the camp branding ethos. I think it's starting to be a movement. And I think you do see it when the most high-tech people want a low-tech education for their children. Steve Jobs didn't want his kids to have iPads or iPhones, no. He, he wanted them to have long conversations at dinner. And many, many Silicon Valley parents send their children to Waldorf schools, Montessori schools, schools where there's very little technology because the mandarins of this new society often put as their highest value um, the kind of conversation that this technology undermines. There's nothing wrong with phones. There's nothing wrong with connectivity. I love connectivity. What, let I me mean, just get that. I can't turn this off. Hello? I don't think for me the point is to unplug. I think the point is to know when to take a break. Ah, fica aí, ó, dando mais importância pra frase falsa do Shakespeare do que pra essa guria linda aqui, tia. Olha aí, teu celular foi embora. Fica de kkk, kkk, de fofoquinha no celular. Por isso ela criou a solução definitiva pra esse problema. O anulador de celular polar. The cell phone in fire works like this. You put the beer in, the turn is on. And after you turn it on, the signal is blocked. No signal. This is a smart device to, to trigger a, a response and make people uh, start thinking that, all right, maybe here at the bar we should talk more, not be slaves to our smartphones. Here in Brazil, many people use the cell phones 24 hours a day. People is not, are not living the moment, they're living the virtual world and everything that's happened on the internet is more, in, more interesting, more important than their friends that write in front of each other. People are losing the capacity for boredom. When, you, when you're experiencing boredom, your brain is not bored. Your brain is doing some of the most important work that it knows how to do. It's laying down, it's called the default mode network. It's, it's, the, it's part of the basic autobiographical story of your life. It's doing important work for your mental stability and your emotional stability. And these days, when people are alone, even for a few moments, they reach for a device. And there's an extraordinary study that shows that after as little as six minutes alone, people would rather give themselves electroshocks, self-administer electroshocks, rather than just sit quietly alone. Yet there is a growing group of people who want to unplug once in a while. It's especially the elite with the most expensive smartphones who choose to disconnect. In the German Black Forest, a luxury spa caters to this need, offering deep sleep and digital detox treatments in carefully constructed rooms where brass plates and graphite wallpaper block all Wi-Fi and phone signals. When you are with a mountain bike or hiking in the Black Forest, you see that you will have no connection. On most of the parts of the Black Forest, there is no connection. When you are always connected, you are never 100% focused. 
in Villa Stefani we have 15 rooms, so from these 15 rooms we have three very large suites and, and 12 um, double rooms. We don't force every client here to disconnect. You have some hotels also there, there is no Wi-Fi. Yeah? Here the clients can choose and we have a nice book here from Daniel Sieberg, it's the digital diet, it's the four steps how to get rid of this device and then had to break and to make some, some breaks. And when we see that clients maybe are open for this, we just give them the book and say, okay, you have time, just read. And maybe then they say it's nothing for me or they say, okay, I will try. I will try that this time for lunch, yeah, we take the tablets away and we will talk to each other. Yeah? Of course, you can choose to go offline for a few days, either in a luxury hotel or in a cabin in the woods. It seems so simple. Just leave your phone at home, right? But is it also possible to live offline every day, no phone or internet, and still participate in society? The Armenian mountains are the home of popular writer Aram Pachyan. He is sometimes called the new Franz Kafka. His stories and poems are shared on the internet, but he has tossed his mobile phone away and chooses to live an analog life, so he can concentrate on writing. Even in Armenia, where parcels sent by snail mail often fail to arrive, the density of cell phone towers on our White Spots app is dizzying. առաջինը առաջին վերաբերմունքը հետաքրքրություն էր սկզբից այսինքն ինչ որ որը ժամանակ կայ Facebook-ում Twitter-ում ունեի հերախոս երևի մի տարի երկու տարի պահում էի բայց այդ ամենին չէ այդ ամեն ինչի իմաստը վերջին հաշվով իմաստի հետ խնդիրներ ունեցավ որովհետև Եվ որ քեզ դու հասանել ես ամեն անգամ քեզ զանգում են ու քեզ բռնացնում են եւ ով ունի քո հերախոսի համարը ու մի նաեւ քո կյանքը հետո հետո սկսվեց հետո սկսվեց ինչ որ ֆիզիկական ու գիտակցական ինչ որ սոցիալի հոգնածություն շատ հոգնած էի ու ընդհանրապես զանգերի չի պատասխանում ու մի օրը որոշեցի որ դեմ պիտի նատամ հերախոսը ու այդպես էլ արեցի ու կորցրել է նաև հենց այդ հենց այդ ամենի պատճառով որովհետև ինչ որ մի պահի ամնեզիա է առաջանում էկրանի առաջ այդ սոցիալական կայքերում Արնդան ոնց են քես գտնում մարտիկ հնգերներ այդ ոնց են քես գտնում ինձ ասպես ասում եթե շատ են ուզում ինձ կգտնեն մանավանդ Երևանում If I want to find uh, Aram I'm calling to Armen because he is the main contact with uh, Aram and uh, also if I need him very much uh, I'm coming here because I know his lunch time and he's coming every day to here and, <laughs> and so yeah. we, we we find some kind of um, different ways to find Aram It's just a question of some people need it some people want this iPhone, <laughs> some people don't need it and they can be happy without it. Happy and successful also. Orinaki Hamar, I think Arami Varka Darna Shat Modai, Sansa Chomia, May Sarjum Hyastansk C, Deming Vajain Herrahos Neri. A Devkum Artank Arwa is Kakan Tasara Kutsunsk, Sivera Javorel, Technikan Shat Hetakita do Inca Natra Labets, Hetakia Vidam Vonses Octago. մեր կարողանում մի միանց այդ շփվել։ Ես ընդհանրապես դեմ չեմ, սա իմ կյանքն է, 
թող մարդիկ օգտագործ են շփվել իրենց ամբողջ ժամանակ ժամանակ ու իրենց կյանքը նվիրեն սոց կայքերին ու հեռախոսներին ես ուղակի ու կարծում եմ որ այդ մենակությունը բարիք է իրականում այդ մարդուն տրված լավագույն լավագույն վիճակներից մեկն է որ բնությունն է լունի կարծում եմ որ միտքը միտքը ընդհանրապես մի անգամից չի ծնվում այդ երկարատը խմորումների արդյունքն այն ու դրա համար դրա համար երկարատև ժամանակ ա պետք որ այդ միտքը ի վերջո քոմեր ծնվի Ենտեղ որտեղ Wi-Fi չկա, այդ երջանկություն է երևի։ What if there was a way to light up the entire globe and finally make all the world's information accessible to all of the world's people? Well, maybe finding an answer starts with looking somewhere new. Like up. and trying something different, like balloons. Yep, that's right, balloons. Because it turns out that if you use balloons, it's faster and easier and cheaper to give everyone the internet than it is to give some people the internet. While the offline movement is growing, the internet rolls on. The island of Sri Lanka was chosen by tech giant Google to be the first country with 100% coverage of free Wi-Fi. The company uses balloons equipped with the internet routers as part of the experimental Google Loon project. Sri Lanka's Minister of Information is bubbling over with enthusiasm. <laughs> दर्शन <laughs> But what exactly is the logic behind covering the globe with a digital web? What's behind all these initiatives to hook up the entire world using drones, satellites and balloons? We ask internet critic Evgeny Morozov. The goal is 100% connectivity on a planetary scale. Is that going to happen? Well, I think it's quite likely. Uh, as long as you can have some expected return coming from an area of the world, um, it's quite logical to expect that there will be somebody interested in integrating it into the world market. I mean, for me, that's what it's all about, because it makes life easier for main players of globalization, which happen to be corporations. And then, of course, you need to integrate those areas into this network and how do you integrate them into the network well you basically build connectivity you build networks uh, you you know make sure that any asset uh, has the capacity to generate data send it receive it process it and so forth and then you just need to have a massive amount of investment into creating those networks I think with Google, there is a concentrated effort, but also with Facebook. I mean, it's sort of many of the firms that now operate into what has been called surveillance capitalism, right? It's this idea that somehow by aggregating data, by analyzing it, you can maybe offer some services which are nominally free to the users, but nonetheless, you can monetize them because you're generating data that advertisers are interested in. So there are a lot of companies that are interested in that model. Mm -hmm. 
you think it's wise for Sri Lanka to accept Google Loon's total connectivity for their country? Well, I think in the case of many developing countries, and I think Sri Lanka here would be one of many, uh, they are making a trade-off which fits uh, with what the government itself uh, believes, and I think what the government itself believes is that markets are good, uh, American companies are good, uh, creating more dependencies is probably okay as long as we can get some cash back. Uh, and in terms of electability, it's also a very great pitch to their population because ultimately the population gets something good, connectivity, with the government paying absolutely nothing for its provision. I mean, ultimately, I think we have to understand that this is the new developmental model, that the idea is that these companies will come and build a lot of services for you, connectivity being one of them, but health, education, transportation, and others are waiting also to be offered with those companies quickly taking over parts of the infrastructure that previously was offered differently. And ultimately, if you really want to go beyond the current model, you have to be asking very political economic questions about things like data. Is data an asset? Can it be privately owned? Is it okay for a company like Google to collect my data while I'm using the service, then claim it as their own, and then basically derive all sorts of benefits, including financial benefits, from that data? You know, when I used to use the post office, I would have never thought that the post office would ever claim ownership over the contents of my letters. Er zijn niet zoveel plekken, een paar bergketens zo te zien waar je naartoe moet. Maar ja, dan moet je alpinist zijn, dat is ook niet iedereen gegeven. Dus in Europa zal het des te meer noodzakelijk zijn om de mogelijkheid tot dit soort white spots mogelijk te gaan maken. Political philosopher Paul Frissen too is critical of the ambition to supply the entire world with cell phone towers and airborne routers that permanently communicate with our smartphones. He's afraid that because of the data trails we leave behind, nothing can ever be hidden anymore. You see all kinds of movements in the world of the economy, in the world of beleid, in the world of international relations, also in the domain of safety, to come to a total decking to come, uh, in terms of infrastructure, to uh, also see what we do in a physical sense, but also in a virtual sense, of following systems to see. Nou ja, om op die manier eh, voortdurend bij te kunnen houden waar iemand is. En dat wordt natuurlijk altijd verkocht met de argumenten van de vooruitgang. Eh, het is toch fijn als iedereen in 2020, eh, want dat moet je dan zeggen, in 2020 kan beschikken over toegang tot internet via een smartphone. En uiteraard is dat ook plezierig voor mensen om die mogelijkheden te hebben. En er zit ook altijd een keerzijde aan. Eh, er zit een keerzijde aan dat je daarmee eh, de vrijheid inlevert, omdat... De privacybescherming en de bescherming van het recht om het rust gelaten te worden, neemt navenant af. Heel veel mensen zeggen, maar als ik niks te verbergen heb, dan is het toch geen probleem? Nee, dat klopt. Alleen er zijn geen mensen die niks te verbergen hebben. Die bestaan niet. Heel simpel en plat gezegd, uh, geef de pincode maar. Nou, dat doet ook vrijwel niemand. Uh, en uh, er is zoveel te verbergen bij iedereen, uh, omdat je niet alles aan iedereen wil vertellen. Nee, dus mensen zeggen, ik heb niks te verbergen. Dat is echt, die kennen zichzelf niet. De puur fysieke aanwezigheid van die hele infrastructuur en al die, al die middelen en apparaten en apps die data verzamelen, ja, die kun jij niet uitzetten. Dat is het probleem. En dat maakt het, het definiëren van een plek waar je onzichtbaar bent echt een stuk moeilijker. Hoe kan ik daar als individu mee omgaan? Het, het lijkt zoiets wat over ons heen komt waar we niks mee kunnen. Nou ja, dat is ook een groot probleem. Hè? Die palen die we straks zagen op die, euh, op die app, nou ja, die kun je natuurlijk niet uitzetten. Maar je zou moeten nadenken of je, of je burgers het recht kunt geven om onzichtbaar te zijn daarvoor. Misschien kunnen we dat ook technisch mogelijk maken om onzichtbaar te zijn. Maar die, 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 het recht op onzichtbaarheid is echt heel fundamenteel. En misschien dat de technologie zelf 
ook weer allerlei mogelijkheden biedt om dat te organiseren. Dus dat je er wel bent, maar elektronisch niet kunt worden gezien en waargenomen. Een soort hè, kooi van Faraday om je heen, waardoor de mensen je wel in een fysieke zin zien, maar elke device die jou kan waarnemen op een blokkade stuit. Based in the Netherlands, Holland Shielding is one of the world's market leaders in products that protect against electromagnetic radiation. Demand for these products has increased steeply over the past few years. The Internet of Things means that the bandbreedte nog veel groter moet zijn om alle apparaten te kunnen verbinden. Dat betekent dat we naar nog hogere frequenties toe moeten gaan. En dat betekent dat er steeds meer beschermmateriaal nodig is om dat tegen te houden. Dit is een antenne en daar kunnen we een heel groot spectrum mee meten. Dat doen we hier in een anagoïsche meetruimte. En daar kunnen we dus vaststellen hoeveel straling dat een apparaat uitgeeft. Of hoe gevoelig dat hij ervoor is. En dan kunnen we het apparaat zo aanpassen dat hij wel aan de norm kan voldoen. We maken nu 24.000 verschillende producten. Wij groeien ondanks de crisis een procent of 30 per jaar, dus dat is gigantisch. With the increasing wireless communication between all these devices, the chance of being tracked, traced and spied upon has risen accordingly. So there's a new market for radiation-free protection cages. Secret services and law firms are among the buyers. Holy crap. It's beautiful and horrifying. Birgitta Jonsdottir, poet, hacker and member of the Iceland Parliament, knows digital networks from the inside out. She also knows how it feels to be observed and spied on constantly. I know that I'm under heavy surveillance because of my involvement with uh, WikiLeaks and Snowden. And there's nothing I can really do to stop it because it's so much. And what bothers me about that is that everybody who calls me is under surveillance. Everybody who writes to me is under surveillance. Do you remember the first time you went online? Yeah, I actually do. Uh, it was in 1995 and uh, I just fell in love with it. So I felt it was a completely new possibility for creating new cultures and new ways of doing things, both socially and creatively. So. Um, unfortunately, it became industrialized, and the internet today, compared to how the internet was back then, is entirely different planet. <laughs> it's become just like a, a really sad version with some of the worst things on, on planet Earth. It's uh, become a tool to spy on us, uh, a tool to manipulate us, and to make us into these completely perfect uh, consumers. So we've become a commodity. Our most precious secret um, um, elements of our being are being sold as commodity to push more stuff towards us. Our computers and phones have these cameras. And these cameras can be turned on remotely. And it's happened lots of times. So uh, there's a reason why a lot of activists uh, and people that are aware of this uh, are have started a while ago to use uh, stickers that are specifically designed to put over the camera and you can take it off if you want to go and on Skype. They can also hear what you are because there's a microphone in the computer. Uh, and the same applies to even Barbie dolls and, um, and your television. And it's gonna get into everything, all your devices. 
voice recognition requires massive processing. So it's uh, sent off into a cloud. And a cloud is just a computer somewhere. It's not like it's up in the digital sky. It's just in very powerful computers. And so these companies that create these devices, they have direct access into your device. So somebody can be on the other line uh, seeing you and hearing you. The Hello Dream House has the ability to be Wi-Fi connected. It also responds to speech commands. Hello Dream House, bring the elevator down. That is so cool! Horn dance party, coming up! Even in some cars you have voice command. And this is all happening very quickly. And I have not seen any laws or regulations about this. Nowhere. And so we're worried that hackers can get into our computers and take control over them. Uh, what if they can get control over your car, the computer in your car, uh, or the computer that monitors um, your heart? <laughs> if you think about all the stuff that you are in no control of putting into this massive database that's about you, that's dangerous. You know, now I work as a legislator and I have uh, specialized in the field of uh, legislation that deals with these realities. And the fact of the matter is that um, no legislator in the world has been able to keep up with the rapid development. Technology is creeping further and further into our lives, says Jon Stottir. But if the government can't keep up with this digital acceleration, how can we get a grip on it? The tightly knit community of the Amish in the United States has lived through centuries of debating and adjusting new technologies. These fundamentalist Christians only occasionally allow novelties such as cars, telephones or computers into their daily lives, after careful consideration and on their own terms. With us Amish, we are dependent on public transportation for any distance and and, and local travel, we do it in our slow way. And I think the horse and buggy slows us down and really helps the overall value that we're trying to create and preserve and not get carried away. Reverend Norman Yoder is willing to talk to us, but only off camera. He does not want to be filmed. What are the okay. parameters? Um, uh, just uh, for sure not my face. I'd rather not have anything of me as far as that's concerned. The surroundings, I don't care. But as far as me, I don't want to be filmed. It, it's in the Ten Commandments of not worshipping any images. When technology comes along, we evaluate it. And one thing we... It's, it's really been frustrating to us. Let's say the facts putting this printed paper through there and going through that line, you know, that, it was like, well, we don't want to go there. But finally, we adapted to that. So by the time most of the community adapted to that, that technology was already gone. They wanted email. So that's what we're dealing with. The technology is progressing so fast, it, it's hard to deal with. As a group, we see more and more, we have to teach what the moral impact is Whoa. in being Whoa. involved in Back. this, so each individual Back. can make better choices for themselves. We were asked to put a cell phone tower on our land. They wanted to rent, but we never did it. The towers came was not for us, not for our people, it was for the other people. So it was here, and as more and more people adapted to it, uh, yeah, the demand was that you communicate that way was getting higher and higher. We deal with a lot of non-Amish, 
they demand instant communication, they need to know now. And we get wrapped up in that, you know. Now, dealing with internet, email, that is a serious issue. A regular computer with your safety walls, you know, where you can't get on porn sites and things like that. Now, when our lockdowns that we have, that is totally locked down. Can you go on the, on the internet with this computer? No, no, absolutely not. It will not play a movie picture or uh, music or anything like that. It's not a computer that was torn down. It was built from the ground up like this. Especially for Amish? Yes. Would you mind showing me your mobile phone? Okay, yes. We keep it actually right over here in the drawer. And it's just a regular flip phone. And, and the only thing you can do with that is call. You cannot text, do anything like that. It's just a portable phone. So this is where it stays. But uh, as far as going home, no, I don't have it. I keep it right here. That's for the business. We use technology as long as we use it and it doesn't get to the point where it uses us and controls us. That's the bottom line of it. The Amish want to keep control of their lives and have distilled some strict directives for new technology. But there is some room for personal interpretation. Down the road is the home of seamstress Marilyn Lehman, after consulting her husband, she agrees to talk to us on camera. For her sewing business, she really needs a phone. Do you have a phone? Uh, not in the house, we don't have a phone, but we have a phone outside. Uh, we call it our phone shan shanty. And uh, yeah, we just have a voicemail, so that's how people contact us if we, um, if if they need something, they know they can leave a message. And usually, once an hour or so, I run out to check messages and then I reply them. So, otherwise, yeah, we don't have the phone in the house. That way, I can just continue with my work and I know the voicemail's there. If somebody does need something, they can always leave a message. It's right outside. Um, it's beside the barn. I only have like 50 feet or so to go. So, yeah, I just really like it out there. Have you been online? No, mm -mm. no, I wouldn't know how to get online. <laughs> so, no, I've never been online. Are you curious about the internet? Um, I cannot even really say that I am. I mean, it's never crossed my mind because I guess we've had successful business now for 14 years without any computer access or internet access or, yeah, just me and my faithful old phone shack. <laughs> so. This is about us, all of us. Right now, a couple billion of us have access to the internet and amazing things have come from it. So what happens when the rest of us get access? It doesn't get twice as good. It gets like a bazillion times as good. Imagine it, for the first time in history, humanity firing on all cylinders, everyone, everywhere. It starts up here at 60,000 feet with planes powered by the sun opening up the internet to people everywhere. Google and Facebook are the new colonial powers. 
Uh, to some extent, uh, yes. Uh, they are new colonial powers uh, because they operate very closely with the foreign agendas of the U.S. government. That clearly has a certain imperial uh, dimension to it. You're basically seeing huge extraction of value and huge extraction of uh, assets, intangible ones like data, which I think will be key to the functioning of those economies and to their ability to actually articulate the sovereign alternative to a world where otherwise they will end up completely integrated into a system where they cannot write the rules, they cannot sue the companies, and they just have to follow the dictate of corporations, essentially. Hi, Mark. Hey. Uh, myself, Alkijan, and I'm a chartered accountant by profession. So my question is very simple. And why are you showing so much interest in India? Answer honestly. <laughs> so our mission is to give everyone in the world the power to share what's important to them and to connect every person in the world. And India is the world's largest democracy. It's you know, one of the, the biggest countries where if you really have a mission of connecting every person in the world, you can't do that without helping to connect everyone in India. We Facebook, they consider themselves to be the biggest community in the world. The biggest democracy because there are more people on Facebook than in China or India. So what Facebook did recently was uh, they... Uh, offered something that was uh, or is called uh, free basics in India. Free basic uh, means that they want to give free internet to the poorest people in India at a cost. And the cost is that you have only access to what Facebook wants you to have access to. It's the complete opposite to net neutrality. And there was a massive uh, sort of protest against this. And so what Facebook did to try to... Uh, push it even further was that they sent a message to all the Facebook users in India to urge them to sign a petition for free basics. They were testing how far they could get away with it. And they didn't start with a small country, but the, the largest populated country in the world. Uh, and, you know, if there had not been some resistance towards this and awareness building, then they would have gotten away with it. Welcome to Facebook. Thank you. Thank you. Now, there's still a billion people in India who we need to connect to the internet. And connecting them represents one of the greatest opportunities available to humanity today. So I'm deeply appreciative of Prime Minister Modi's <coughs> commitment to digital India to make this enormous opportunity a reality for all Indians. You have to understand what drives those companies. Those companies are not really interested in immediate payoffs. They're, inter they're, they're only interested in convincing their investors that they will keep on growing indefinitely. So as their user growth slows down in North America and Western Europe, they have to convince their investors in financial markets that they have the capacity to capture the markets in India, China, Russia, Latin America, and so forth. And the easiest way to convince the investors is by basically striking this deal with telecom operators, in the case of Facebook, and then the same also in the case of Google, to bring in more and more people on board in the hopes of convincing the investors that once those people are on board, they'll also become users of Facebook, Google, and so forth. What if I'm living with my tribe in the forest in Sri Lanka and I don't want that connectivity? Well, I think if you're living in with uh, your tribe in Sri Lanka, chances are you wouldn't even notice that it's there uh, unless there is an effort to extract value from you uh, by means of collecting data about you. 
once you make connectivity a permanent feature of everyday life across the globe, uh, ultimately people who find themselves amidst that connectivity will help to pay for the connectivity itself. We are definitely in the black zone. In the last 20 years, the advancement of technology has probably put our guidelines more in a chaos than in ever in history. And it's a serious thing. Where is this leading? The technology that the computer and the internet is that basic technology is creating the availability to have a one world order and everything being done by paperless and all that. So the question to us is, when is that time gonna be that we say, we're just not gonna adapt? And I, I think what we're trying to do is a good example that could realistically be adapted in the whole world if we want to. I don't see a future where we massively disconnect. I see a future where we learn to connect with greater wisdom. Um, that's my hope. Thank you for watching. For more on this subject, take a look at the playlist. You can also watch this recommended video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and we'll keep you updated on our documentaries.